There is no way that I could have ever grown my business without having a team. And the first team member I ever hired didn't even work in my store. So today I want to talk to you about how to grow your business organically by utilizing a remote team. Welcome to the Bringing Business to Retail podcast, where I, Selena Knight, share strategies, interview retail revolutionaries, and delve into the minds of e-commerce experts to help you grow a profitable, independent retail or e-commerce business. If you're stuck in a rut, or if you feel like business is way harder than it should be, or you've overachieved all of the things that you've set out to and are wondering what to do next, or how do I even make this better? I know that you're going to love today's episode. If you're stuck in a rut, feel like business is way harder than it should be, or you've achieved all of the things that you set out to and are wondering what next, or how do I even make this better? Then I know that you're going to love today's episode. Hey there, and welcome to today's episode of the Bringing Business to Retail podcast. I'm so happy that you could join me here today, and I really do appreciate the fact that You've chosen to spend a little bit of time with me here learning how to grow your retail or e-commerce business because I know there are a lot of podcasts out there that you could be listening to, but you've chosen to be here with me. So for that, I say thank you very much. And I hope that today's episode is going to help you do exactly that, to scale your retail or e-commerce business. Now, the first hire I ever made in my retail business was a virtual assistant. Now, I was quite lucky because the first one I hired actually turned out to be quite good. But then after a little while, things went downhill and it turned me off having a VA for quite some time. So after that, I hired real people to work in my store and I delegated jobs. So they were working either on the shop floor or in the storeroom and they were doing other jobs as well, like social media or answering emails, which works up until a point. But Then when you have to scale because you've outgrown where you are right now, sometimes you don't need an actual physical team member. Sometimes you just need somebody to take some of the stress off your plate to handle your inbox or to reach out to customers to answer emails. And as business owners, I know that you probably struggle with not having your fingers in all the pies. That's a double negative, isn't it? So that's not really the best English, but you struggle not being in control of all of the things. And I know this because I work with people just like you and I see it day in, day out. And look, I'm certainly not immune to this myself. I like to have my fingers in all the pies, keeping control of what's going on. But there is a certain point where you realize that that is what's holding you back. You are stalling your business growth. So when you know that you need to grow and you need people to help you do that, but maybe you don't need a physical workforce, you have to go remote. And finding those people can be difficult. Onboarding those people can be difficult. Creating the job for those people can be difficult. So I met today's guest, Nate Hirsch, at Traffic and Conversion at one of the after events. We were hanging out with Rachel Miller. If you've been listening for a while, you'll probably remember Rachel. We, we laugh that you got a two hour episode in about 35 minutes because we both talk, to, talk so fast, but she's the guru when it comes to making Facebook posts go viral completely organically. In fact, I was supposed to interview Rachel at Traffic and Conversion this year, which of course got postponed because of COVID. Needless to say, she will be coming back on the show next year when we're live at Traffic and Conversion. So Rachel and I and a bunch of other people were hanging out after the conference, having a drink, and I sat next to Nathan, Nate, Nathan, we talk about why he's Nate as opposed to Nathan, or Nathan as opposed to Nate nowadays, and we got to talking about the experiences that we had bringing on virtual team members. Now Nathan at the time owned a recruitment agency that aligned businesses with pre-vetted virtual assistants. Now. He did such a great job with that agency that he was bought out just recently. The whole company was acquired by the Hoth. Now he's back with a new product to help business owners to grow their businesses using remote team members. And I wanted to get him on the show today to talk about the journey, to talk about what we should be looking for with our team members, how to onboard them, standard operating procedures. We go into everything. Let's not wait any longer and jump into today's episode with Nathan Hirsch from OutsourceSchool.com. 
Hey there, and welcome to today's episode of the Bringing Business to Retail podcast. Now, I have interviewed probably hundreds of virtual assistants, and I've hired dozens of them. And some of them haven't gone so well, and some of them have been amazing. And I've had team members who are still with me here today working in this business that have come over from previous businesses. So today I want to talk about how you can scale your business and how you can manage a team of remote employees so that you can grow without having to do the work yourself. I've brought on Nathan Hirsch from previously from Free up. <laughs> free up. I just got free two people, I was gonna say. <laughs> second. I brought on Nathan Hirsch previously from Free Up, which was recently acquired and now from Outsource School to talk us through the whole shebang, how you can use virtual assistants to grow your business organically, how you manage them, how you build a culture. This dude knows it all. Clearly he does because his business was bought by somebody else. So welcome to the show, Nathan. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. It should be a lot of fun. Do you prefer Nate or Nathan? It's funny. Normally I go by Nate, but we just added an affiliate manager and his name is Nate. So to keep everything clear, I'm Nathan, he's Nate. <laughs> well, you have to change your name for the team. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> That's literally taking one for the team. Whatever I have to do for the team, you know? <laughs> so tell me, you, like you've been an entrepreneur for quite a while, haven't you? Like back in college, you started your first business. Yeah. I've never had a, a real job besides some internships and, and stuff before college. And so that first business was selling textbooks. Yeah. So I started off uh, buying and selling people's textbooks, competing with my school bookstore. I offered more money than them. I created a, a little referral program. And before I knew it, there were lines out the door of people trying to sell me their books to the point where I actually got a cease and desist letter from my college telling me to knock it off. And I was pretty scared at the time. My parents were both teachers. I didn't want to get kicked out of school. So I, I quickly pivoted. So although my first business was textbooks, I really only did that for about a year. And what was cool was I came across Amazon when I was selling these books. So when I had to pivot, I had this 24 seven Amazon store. This was 2008, 2009. No one knew what Amazon was. And I just started doing a lot of experimenting, a lot of trial and error until one day I came across baby products. And for whatever reason, I got really good at selling baby products. I sold over a million dollars within my first year and I never looked back. Wow. That's great. Well, there you go. We have something in common because my first retail business was baby products as well. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great industry. I feel like moms will pay anything for, for their kids and their smaller products are easier to ship. There's just like a lot of e-commerce benefits. Oh, and not only that, there's a never ending supply of babies, right? Right. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And you managed to grow that business quite significantly. You got to a million dollars in your first year. And then that just kept growing. How did you manage to, I always say that you can hustle to the first million dollars. And after that, right. you need help. <laughs> well, that, that's exactly what happened. Um, I mean, I was, so I was growing really quickly and I met with an accountant. And the first question he asked me is, when are you going to hire your first person? And I kind of shrugged him off. Like, why would I do that? That's money out of my pocket. And he just laughed in my face. And he said, you're going to learn this lesson on your own. And sure enough, as we kept growing, my life just became crazier and crazier. I was working 20 hours a day. My social life was plummeted. My grades went down. Like it was all over the place. And finally, one busy season, I just get destroyed in the fourth quarter. And I think to myself, man, I need to start hiring people. And so I start off hiring college kids. They quickly prove to be unreliable. They're drinking, <laughs> smoking weed on the job and, and all that. And, and that's how I pivoted and got into the remote hiring world out of necessity. And how did you do that? I mean, I've been, I've started e-commerce in 2007. So I feel like we were both in that world at the same time. And we had Upwork. And what was the other one? Odesk. Uh, Odesk was before them. Or, was I mean, the they're the same company, but. They are, they, they joined in the end, but. I found it really difficult to sift through the people. Tell us, let's be honest, I'm sure you went through some really difficult times right at the beginning as well and ended up with these people who I always got, uh, I actually remember writing in one of my position descriptions at one point, please do not apply if your mum is going to get sick, your dog is going to die, or a typhoon is going to hit and you won't have internet for the next three months because I must have got those same three answers for why work wasn't getting done a hundred times. 
Yeah. And, and I'd love to share with you my onboarding process to avoid all that. But I mean, real quick, I had the, the same experience. I mean, I, I actually, I lucked out both times. My first college kid I hired, his name was Connor Gillivan and he was an amazing hire. He's been my business partner for 10 years. So I hit the jackpot. There I am thinking, hiring is easy. You post a job on Facebook, someone shows up and I proceed to make terrible college kid hires. Well, same thing happened with VAs. My first hire, Chicky Ann, she's been with me for eight plus years. She, um, I'm the godfather of one of her kids. She got a very large amount of money with our, our buyout of free up. And, and so then I think, man, hiring VAs is easy. You go to Upwork, you find someone and your life becomes easier. And I proceeded to make terrible hires after that. And it really took years of developing a hiring process. And I feel like what we did was a slow way. Every time someone went through and had an issue, we went back and we added something to our interviewing, something to our onboarding, something to our training to prevent that from happening again. And finally, after all these issues years later, we had this great hiring process, that, which is one of the reasons why we're so excited about Outsource School, just to share this with people that they can just implement right away to avoid all the issues that you and I both ha have had. So with FreeUp, you managed to scale that really quickly. You and I met up uh, at Traffic and Conversion a couple of years back, and I know that it was doing okay then, but you managed to scale that exponentially, and then it was acquired. I feel like that's kind of the ultimate. When someone else wants to buy your business, you've done a really good job. <laughs> How did you do that? Yeah. So, I mean, free up came about because we got sick of the Upworks and the fibers of the world and we kept looking for a better platform. And when we couldn't find one, we said, you know what, we'll build it ourselves." And we really designed it on what we wanted if we were a client going to the marketplace, specifically an e-commerce seller, because that's what we were. So we originally designed it to be for Amazon sellers. And the whole idea was thousands of applicants every week, only the top 1% get in, make them available to people quickly. The freelancers and the clients like the quick matching, no competing against 50 people or interviewing 50 people on the back end, great support in case you have even the smallest issue and a no turnover guarantee. If people quit, we cover replacement costs. So we took this to market with the crummiest software. We took a $5,000 investment to start this company, put 4,500 into the software that did very little freelancers could log in, clients could log in, freelancers could log their time. And, and that was it. The software didn't do anything else. And so we, we went to Amazon sellers and we said, Hey, we have this Rolodex of freelancers from my Amazon business. We've already vetted. We, we can vouch for them. We'll back you up if anything goes wrong. And people liked it. They said, Hey, I need a customer service rep, an Amazon lister, an Amazon graphic designer, whatever it is. And we matched them up quickly. They liked it. They started telling other people. And one of the best business decisions we made was creating an affiliate program right from day one. So we said, hey, any clients you refer, you get 50 cents for every hour that we build to them forever. And it was on our website. We told every single person we talked to at the end of every phone call, hey, by the way, we have this great affiliate program. And before we knew it, people start talking about us around the world. I remember people saying, hey, I heard about you in a conference in China and I've never been to China. So wow. this, the word started to spread and we quickly ran out of freelancers and, and VA. So we had to build a recruitment team and start recruiting. Eventually we started making more money and we invested into our software and built out this really this entire platform, which is one of the reasons that um, we got acquired as well. Um, and, and we really scaled this business very organically. We went from a $5,000 investment to a million to 5 million to 9 million to 12 million in four years before being acquired. And it starts with that affiliate program. That's the baseline. Next, it's going on podcasts. And, and this is, by the way, this is an organic playbook that applies to everyone. And we're doing the same playbook on Outsource School. We teach it to our members and, and they're using it on their business. A lot of them are in e-commerce, marketing agencies, whatever it is. So Going on podcasts is great because you get to build relationships. I mean, you and I were chatting before the show. You get to get in front of hopefully thousands of your ideal uh, audience if you do it properly. Um, it's good for backlinks. It's good for SEO of your website. And off of podcasts, we look for partnerships. We look for other people in the space who all have the same target audience but don't offer the same services. So we went after Amazon software companies, Helium 10, Seller Labs, and we said, hey, you don't offer VAs, we don't offer Amazon software, let's partner. And we had all this organized with the VA. We actually have a course as part of our membership called the Partnership Playbook on how to set this up and have a VA manage it all because once you set it up, you're like, hey, every six months we'll do a, a blog swap, an email blast, a webinar, a VIP dinner, whatever it is, and a VA would organize all this and send out a reminder and make it easy for the partners. And over time, we built out three. 300 plus partners that were just constantly promoting free up every single quarter. And, and that was obviously very helpful. 
off of that is networking. So I, I, to this day, I network with three new entrepreneurs every single day. I reach out to them, not to pitch them, not to sell them, just to set up a call to learn about their business, tell them more about me and my story. And if there's some way to help each other or work together, fantastic. If not, it's good meeting other people in your space. And you can do that no matter what space you're in. Next would be influencers, going after influencers that can promote your product, promote your service. That's a little bit harder and there's a lot of failure there, but it's hiring a VA to do research and the consistency. And then lastly, putting out content. Anyone that follows me on any social media channel knows I put out content every single day on all channels and you can obviously hire a VA to manage that as well. So combination of affiliate program on the baseline, podcasts, partnerships, influencers, content, networking, and they all kind of go together, right? The networking can lead to podcasts, the podcast could lead to partnerships, the, the networking could lead to an affiliate, um, but that's the organic marketing playbook that really can work for any business and anything you do in ads only complements what you're doing organically. I think where a lot of people go wrong there, and this is not necessarily, well, I guess we can tie this back because you're going to tell me how you've managed to do this with a VA, is people, a lot of people do do those things and I'm going to put my hand up and say, we've just hired a VA to help me leverage the fact that when I go on uh, stages or where I go on other people's podcasts, I'm terrible at telling people about that. I'm terrible about leveraging that opportunity. And so when people do go on a podcast or they do get featured in the media or they do uh, get, a, get an award, quite often they post it on social media or they might put it on their website and then nothing happens. So... I'm sure I'm not the first person who doesn't actually leverage those networking opportunities and those relationships, but you're saying that you've leveraged all of that and you haven't done it yourself. Yeah. I mean, the, think of every single process that I mentioned, all six of those as a hundred percent. And I have the VA doing 90%. I'll still do the initial reach, reach out. I, that my personal preference is to not have a VA ever pretend to be me. Other people might do that, which is fine, but I, that's not my thing. And if you, let's say just for podcasts, I have a VA that does research on podcasts. I've trained her to know what podcasts I want, how many reviews, whatever the criteria is. I wake up every single morning to a list of podcasts. It takes me two seconds to go through and see which ones I've already been on. Although she does a, a first check, I do a second check. And then I ma mail it out. People respond. She books it. She uses the Calendly link. I show up for the podcast. I do the interview. I talk to the host before and after. And then afterwards, you and every other podcast gets an email from my VA saying, hey, thanks for having him. Here's a bunch of his links if you need him. And, and that's it. So all the processes are like that. It's the same thing with networking calls. I have someone researching people in the space that would be good to network with. Same thing with partnerships. Someone who not only researches the partners, but manages the partnership afterwards. So you're still involved and it doesn't have to be you. You can have someone on your team or your business partner, or whoever it is. But again, the VA is doing 90% and you're doing that last 10. And it's that consistency over time and setting up the processes and the ability to tweak them and make them better. Like right now, we just set up a social media assistant and we spent two weeks really getting her going. But now all my VAs that are doing my podcast, my research and stuff, they just quickly pass it to her. She promotes it, gets the engagement and it's just a flawless process. So because you're not doing a hundred percent of everything, you can get really good at all the systems and get really good at that last 10%. Mm, I like that. I like that because I know that quite often, even like it doesn't seem to matter whether you're a six figure business owner or a seven figure business owner, what I tend to find is that people who found businesses like to keep their fingers in all the pies. And that means they stay busy for the sake of being busy rather than busy and productive. And it's because they don't like to relinquish control. So let me ask you there, what are some tips? This is not what you came on for. This is not what you signed up for, but what are some tips to relinquishing control so that you can actually scale? Because Quite often what I find, it's the business owners themselves that are holding the business back. Yeah, I, I agree with you there. So one thing that Connor, my business partner and I do is we hold each other accountable to a 90 day rule. And the rule that we have with each other is we don't do any repetitive tasks longer than 90 days without taking it off our plate. And that keeps us from, I mean, we're entrepreneurs too. We have that habit of adding and adding and adding, and it keeps us delegating. And that first month you're, you're trying something out, you're throwing stuff against the wall, you're seeing what works, what doesn't work. By the end of that first month, you have a pretty good idea of what doesn't work. You start creating that draft SOP. You 
you start fine tuning a little bit, you start interviewing someone, maybe you hire them by the end of that second month, that third month, you really tweaking it, getting it there, getting a good SOP, onboarding the person, training them, and it's off your plate at the end of 90 days. And if you keep yourself accountable to that, eventually you just, you come into this habit of pick something up, systematize it, pass it off, pick up the next thing. And when you have other people on your team that are also doing it, that's when it becomes powerful. And that's when you can continue to scale and grow. Uh, I love the 90 day rule. We do that. We do 90 day quarterly, we do 90 day planning sessions with our seven figure e-commerce store owners in one of our programs. And from that, they actually pick a pillar. So we have five core pillars of retail success. We have money, sales, customers, marketing, and impact. And it's funny because I was just about to say all those things that you talked about, about scaling your business, that falls into what we call our impact pillar. And it's the missing pillar. It's the one that people just don't really feel comfortable doing, but you just said it got you from, what was it? 400,000 to 12 million. Uh, We put $5,000 into the company to 12 million in four years. Right. Because you didn't let the impact pillar hold you back. <laughs> I love it. Right. And you still need a good business. You still need like the back end stuff. But this, these are things that over time really scale your business. Yes, 100%. And you can't do it by yourself. And you've just basically said that not necessarily the more people we have on the team, but the more that you can delegate and the quicker you can delegate it to someone who hopefully is better at it than you are. That's what I've always found. The stuff that you delegate, the person you give it to is usually better than you are anyway. That's what you, you brought them on for. That is when you get the growth. Right. And I, so another thing to keep in mind is if you ever want to sell your business, uh, you have to create systems and processes that other people can take on. I mean, when we were doing due diligence, they had a million questions for us. And every time they said, how does billing work? How does customer service work? We said, here's a 50 page SOP that has been up to date because our VA is in charge of the SOPs. They keep them updated. Five minutes later, we could send it to them because we had all that stuff ready to go. So no one wants to buy a business where you're doing everything and everything's in your head, but there's also a misconception because what I, oh, what I heard for the past four years of free up was like, why are you the face of your company? Like you're never going to be able to sell it. If you're going on the podcast, if you're the face, but the truth is that part's very replaceable. They can always get someone else to be the face. They can always bring in someone that's smarter than you at marketing and, and lead generation and, and that can go on podcasts and all of that. But if you're still doing the day-to-day operations of your business, that's something they don't want. They want to SOPs and people running that because you're not going to be there anymore. So although I was the face and I was going on the podcast, and speaking at conferences and stuff like that, all the day-to-day operations of the business ran without me. And that was key. I always laugh at the fact that I had trained my team so well about processes. And admittedly, I probably am not as good in this business. And we've just discussed that this week as I was in my previous business, because the previous business had several stores and lots of employees. But if anything ever changed, so say there was an update to the point of sale, I would come in and someone would say, oh, just wanted to let you know that the point of sale updated. Don't worry. I've already updated the process book. (laughs) And like when you train them to know that that is part of being an employee, if something changes, someone has to be responsible for it. So why not let it be you? It was great. We never had an outdated procedure ever. And I also want, I also, we teach people at outdoor school to think ahead, right? Because once you get 10 VAs, you don't want 10 VAs like reporting to you. You want team leaders and you want assistant team leaders. Well, on the flip side, you don't want to wake up one day and say, oh my God, I need a team leader. Like who should that team leader be? Do I hire externally or internally? But if upfront, when you're hiring VAs, you're giving them ownership of the tasks of the SOPs and you're having them keep it updated over time, people are going to stand out. People are going to take ownership and roll with it. And then when it becomes time to get a team leader, you're you're like, hey, Jane, she's been crushing it. She's been on top of her SOP. She's going above and beyond. She's the next team leader. So by doing that early on, it not only saves you time as a business owner by updating everything, but team leaders establish, which is going to help you later on in your business. Okay. So there are a lot of businesses. I'm thinking about a lot of my one-on-one clients who are terrible at putting processes in place. So what is the first thing that you say to them to make sure they could do that? Because I'm with you. You can't sell a business if there are no processes processes in place. So I like to break down SOPs into three parts to make it simple. The why, the steps, and the important reminders. So 
the why is what everyone misses. It's why are we doing this task? How does it impact the big picture? What's the point of the business? Why am I passionate about it? And I also put in what success and what failure looks like. If I fired three VAs, I won't mention them by name, but I'll say, hey, the last three VAs didn't work out for X, Y, Z reasons. This is what we're looking for in you. So before they even get to the steps, they understand the why of the task, the why of the business, and what success looks like. Then you have the steps and you don't need to, you can create a rough draft of it that gets better over time, but get the steps in there as quick as possible. I'm someone that likes to chip away at stuff. I've never just sat down and written eight pages or eight hours of SOPs or filmed eight hours of courses. I like to chip away at stuff little by little each day. So start chipping away at those steps little by little, doing a little brain dump, getting it out of your head. And then the important reminders, don't hide them in step 12, part B, have them at the bottom. Like my VA that's managing my inbox, I say, hey, if my accountant emails me, if my lawyer emails me, like don't respond to those emails. And I put that at the bottom very, very clear. So if you take every system in your business and you break it down into the why, the steps and the important reminders, and you're just slowly, little by little, first thing each morning, just putting it out there, over time, you're going to build SOPs are going to be good enough to pass off to a VA for them to take ownership of. And that makes it easier for the entrepreneur like me, by the way, who doesn't like writing 50 page SOPs. I get it off the ground. I make it clear. I give them the background and then they take it from there. Okay. Here's a curveball for you. How do you write an SOP when you don't know how to do the thing? Like say, for example, it's building a Shopify website. You have no idea as the business owner how to do that. So how do you write an SOP? Do you just make the person who's doing the work for you do it? Yeah, so, so you can't really write an SOP for, for something that you can't do. I mean, there, there's three different levels of people you can hire, right? Followers, doers, and experts. So followers, they're five to 10 bucks an hour, non-US. They might have years of experience, but they're there to follow your systems, your processes. If you don't know how to do something, you can't hire a follower. And a lot of people call a VA, anyone that works from home. I personally, when I'm talking about VAs, I'm just talking about the followers. Then you got the doers, the video editors, the Shopify developers, the Amazon listers, whatever it is. They do that one task eight hours a day. You're not teaching someone how to be a video editor or how to build Shopify stores, but they're not consulting with you either. They're there to do that one task at a high level. And then you got the experts, the high level freelancers, consultants, coaches, agencies. They could be 50 bucks an hour. They could be a thousand bucks an hour. And they're bringing their own strategy, their own systems to the table. So how you work with each level is a little bit different. If you, just like you wouldn't hire a follower and say, hey, go find me profitable products with no directions, that's not going to work out for you. Or you'd hire an expert and say, hey, I know you've had a lot of success doing it your way with other clients, but I'm hiring you and you're going to follow my directions. That doesn't make a lot of sense either. So how you hire each level matters. So if you're hiring a Shopify developer, they could be either a doer or an expert, depending on how much strategy they're coming in. If you know exactly what you want, then the relationship turns more into outlines and scopes of projects and milestones. And if you're creating multiple Shopify stores, you're not really creating an SOP. You're more creating an outline of what you, what everything, every Shopify store has to have in common. And over time you're figuring out, Hey, it costs X amount for X, Y, Z. And maybe you're getting different developers coming in, but you already know what the price point is. It's kind of like a, a real estate market. If you're constantly renovating condos, you know how much the paint costs, you know how much uh, the, I, I don't know that much about real estate, but the bathrooms, whatever. Um, <laughs> But so it's the same process. And with experts, it's a little bit more about setting milestones, setting goals and creating a strategy that you can look back on and say, hey, is this strategy working or do I have to make tweaks, tweaks to it? So how you work with each level is different. And for, again, SOPs, you could call it, when I'm talking about SOPs, I'm just talking about the followers. I, I 100% agree with you. And I think one of the key things we have to point out is When you hire a VA and we're talking about, let's just assume that from now on, we're talking about that follower group, the people who are doing the things to your standard operating procedures. I find a lot of people who want to find the VA who can do everything, the VA who can do my graphic design, who can go through my inbox, who can upload products to a Shopify website, who can all the things, write all my emails. And that's just not the way it works. And I think a lot of people get caught out there because especially people who founded their own business, They have got their fingers in all the pies and they can do a little bit of everything. So they feel like everybody should be able to do a little bit of everything as well. Right. And not only does it not work that way, you don't really want that. Like, and that's what I tell entrepreneurs, like best case scenario, let's say that all works out perfectly for you. You find a VA, they say rock star, they can do lots of different parts of your business. You invest time, energy, and money into training them. And your entire business relies on this one virtual assistant. 
that is a super risky place to be as a business owner. You are one issue away, whether they get sick, they get pregnant, they get another job offer, whatever it is from having a serious disruption in your business, short term or long term. So even if you could find that person, you don't want that person, it's much better to diversify um, and, and, and drop things into buckets. Hey, this is this is my listing team, this is my customer service team. And, and I made this mistake before. I hired someone and spent six months training them to do all aspects of, of my business only to have them quit my first day on a vacation. So it, it, it can be brutal. And I was I'm fortunate that I made that mistake in year one and, and not in year like seven, eight, nine and learned that lesson early on. But this is what happened. Hiring's hard. People make bad hires. They finally find someone they like, and then they tend to just load that person up with everything. And they don't realize how risky that really makes your business. You want to diversify within reason. If you need a 40 hours of customer service work or a week, hire two people for 20. No one works 365 days a year. They can cover for each other. You don't get pulled back into customer service. But if you're getting 10 emails a day, you don't have to hire four customer service reps. There's still an element of common sense in there. A hundred percent. I think that that is probably one of the key pieces of information that you've given us here. Okay. So say we find the right person. What are the key, the key steps to bringing them on board so that the transition for the, the whole team, so whether it's your team that you've got in-house and you've got other virtual team members, maybe you've got the agencies working, how do you bring somebody on board? And I know I've made this mistake before where I've brought somebody on board and I haven't necessarily introduced them properly to the rest of the team because the rest of the team was an agency or it was someone who was outsourced, we were outsourcing. And it gets very weird because we have conversations and then that conversation doesn't necessarily translate to the next load of people and people, where did this come from? <laughs> so what yeah, do you I mean, I mean, the first thing we do is connect people to who they need to be connected with. And I think that's incredibly important. I mean, it, we'll, we'll spend time introducing like, hey, video editor, team leader, meet our new head of customer service. Like you might be interacting for XYZ reasons. We also have a meeting with everyone every Monday. This is one of the reasons why I tend to not hire agencies unless it's something like expert high level that is just kind of almost separate off to the side of my business. But I'm, I'm, we have a weekly Monday morning meeting, 10 a.m. with everyone. And that would be a time where we'd introduce a new person. We also spend the first five minutes of the meeting. Everyone shares a picture from their weekend and people can engage and laugh and all that stuff and build a little bit of culture, um, which we're all about. We also have culture meetings every other week um, for 30 minutes that my business Connor, partner Connor runs where everyone gets to not only know each other, but we stress what our culture is. We believe in ideas and feedback and bring your A game to the table and, and being positive and and. and looking long term. So we, we spend time doing that. And I think we'll talk about onboarding too, but there's also a certain amount, amount of onboarding to kind of set the expectations of, hey, this is how we communicate. This is what's important. This is what we value in our culture early on. So when you do start introducing them to people, ideally, they're all very similar minded. They've all been set up with the same expectations so that you don't run into issues down the line. And I think that what a lot of people might find scary there is that is a true leadership role. And that is stepping out of your comfort zone of having your fingers in all the pies and doing a little bit of everything and actually taking charge and being responsible for what happens. Right, definitely. And I think that's why we're, we're really excited about outsource schools because we can give people, hey, this is how we run meetings. This is how we build culture. This is how we interview. This is how we onboard. And, and it's stuff that people can just implement into their business very, very quickly. Now, there's there's no like snap your fingers and VA knows what's in your head and gets going. There's going to be a little upfront work, but at least you have the blueprint that you can set up systems and process in your business because that's what you need. I mean, just like you need systems and process in marketing and in bookkeeping, like you need them in all parts of hiring, the interviewing, the onboarding, you need SOP processes, you need firing processes. Let's say you have to fire someone one day, you don't want to be scrambling around, oh, what do I have to do? What access do I have to remove? You need a checklist that so you're like, all right, I need to fire Bob, we're going to go through the checklist. And we even had Jane, my assistant at FreeUp, who was in charge of the checklist. She would go through step by step and remove the person's access, remove them from the, the Skype and the Slacks and all of that. So Think of everything as a system that you need to build over time. And building out your hiring system is a really good one to start with because hiring is going to apply to all other aspects of your business, whether it's bookkeeping, uh, marketing, building e-commerce stores, whatever it is. If you don't have a good hiring process in place, it's going to be really hard to build out those other teams. I am all for shortcuts. I, I am happy to spend money if someone can just give me the blueprint. And then, of course, you usually like to put your own stamp on it. So, 
I really love the fact that you are saying uh, we've got the team meeting blueprint, we've got the hiring, we've got the onboarding, we've got the firing blueprints, all those things, because that's where a lot of people fall down because they don't actually know what to do or they don't know what to do to get the most out of a meeting or to get the most out of onboarding somebody. And to be fair, if you could just pay some money and get somebody who's already done it before, who's already gone through all those mistakes, I'm, I'm all for spending money to do that. Yeah. And, and I mean, like, I like free up They're obviously I'm biased. They're my old company, but that's where I get my VAs from. And uh, you can use our process and get VAs wherever you want. But the point is if you, you can get a really good VA, but if you don't know what to do with that VA after the fact, it only does so much good. You want to have those systems and processes in place, ready to go. I love that. And the, I think that, that was really important saying, if you don't know what you want them to do once they start, and that all comes down to being very, very clear before you hire the person about what you need rather than what you want, I think, because what you need is the person that you need to be hiring. Right. Yeah. 100%. And yeah, I mean, this is why onboarding is so important. And we have what we call our sick method, which is schedule issues, communication, and culture. And before we hire someone, we go through all four of them and we say, Hey, what's your schedule for other clients? How many other clients do you have? What are your hours for the clients? Is this a schedule for us? Or have you ever worked that schedule before? Are you sure it's going to be good for you? We go through issues, which you, you touched upon before the, 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 500 dead grandparents or whatever, but the like personal issues, computer issues, internet issues, weather issues, power issues, and going through, Hey, how often do you have these issues? What are the risks there? What is the backup plan for each issue? And what are the communication expectations for each issue? So if someone says, Hey, I have a backup generator. Don't worry. If I lose power, I have a backup. And two weeks in, they lose power and they're nowhere to be found. You go back and you say, Hey, we already had a conversation about that. Here's a screenshot of you telling me at a backup generator, this is a big red flag for us. What's going on. And it also scares away people when you're like, Hey, listen, we don't work with people that where personal issues interfere with work. We're, we're totally fine. If you need a day off here and there, we're the nicest people in the world, but you come to us and say, Hey, sorry, I can't work for the next month. Like that doesn't fly with us. So the people that have those issues are going to be scared away very upfront because they know that you don't put up with that. And then you go into communication, which is what channels you use, Slack, email, Skype, whatever, how you use them, which is different for every business. Some VAs might hate Skype and you like Skype uh, and it's not a match. You might like Time Doctor, which I personally don't believe in that because I think it doesn't build trust. But I've seen clients who will interview, onboard, train a VA and then say, oh, by the way, I need you to use Time Doctor, which captures your screen. And the VA is like, whoa, I didn't know that. Like I, I wouldn't have applied for this job if you had told me that up front. So getting on the same page there and then culture, which we already talked about. And then at the end, once you've gone through this sick method saying, and this is a 20 to 30 minute process, by the way, it's not like a five hour process. You're, you say, Hey, like, are you sure you want this job? Like you, I'd much rather you back out now that if it's not a fit and there's no big deal, then for us to figure this out down the line. And most of the time they'll back out if they're not a good fit. And yeah, you waste a little bit of time, but that's much better than figuring out it's not a good fit two months later. Uh, there's so much time and effort and money that goes into bringing somebody on board. It doesn't matter what what they do in the business, but there's so much so much energy that goes out there. You, I don't think you can really afford for it to go wrong. So what do they say? Hire slow, fire fast. Yeah, that, that that is an old saying. It, there, there's always there's always exceptions to every rule, but it, it's more about the mindset behind it that you have to have a, a good system that you put people through, not skip steps as you put them through just because you have an urgent fit, so hire. Like, don't skip the onboarding, um, and then if there's red flags early on, and, and this is where it becomes a little trickier. And if you are running into issues with the VA, you have to evaluate a few things. First of all, how much time have you already invested in this person? If they're causing issues in day three, that's a lot different than they, if they're causing issues two years in and you've invested a ton of time into them. Next is what is their potential? Like, is it, are they an A player? Are they a B player? Are they a C player? Because A players you want to keep around. If someone's a B player or a C player and you invested time into them, well, you probably shouldn't have done that. That's a lesson for you going forward, but you probably don't want to put in a ton of effort to get them to turn it around because best case scenario, they're a B or C player. And then lastly, uh, figuring out like what the disruption would be for, for your team, which is a secondary because just because someone is doing a terrible job and it might hurt the team morale temporarily doesn't mean you shouldn't fire them, but it's still a factor that, that you want to consider before making the move so you can plan ahead and make sure that you can fix it quickly and move forward. And in outsource school, you've got blueprints for pretty much all of this, don't you? 
Yeah. So what ended up happening was we sold free up and people started reaching out to us and said like, how do you do it? How did you do it? How do you build an eight figure business just with VAs? And we didn't just wake up one day and hire 35 VAs and cross our fingers and hope it worked out. We had real systems and real processes. So we launched this course called cracking the VA, VA code that does a deep dive and gives our exact blueprints and SOPs for interviewing, onboarding, training, and managing. And we took it to market. And just like any business, you don't know if people are going to like it or hate it. And, and luckily people liked it. So we started launching mini courses all around operations and marketing. So we have a, a course called the podcast outreach formula that teaches you how to hire VAs to get on podcasts. We have a bookkeeping formula that teaches you how to hire VA bookkeepers. So you don't have to do bookkeeping anymore. I hate bookkeeping. So we, we, we have all of those. And instead of just selling everything separately, we turn it into a membership where if you buy our main course, Cracking the VA Code, you get a year access to all our other courses. You get to be part of our community. You get a year of support so we can help you build your team. And we have a great relationship with Free Out, my old company. So you get some deals there as well. And we get to hook you up with good VAs. And we're also building some SOP building software that we're excited about that, that's going to add more value to your members. So that, that's kind of what we're working on now. And um, yeah, it's been a lot of fun. I... I honestly don't think you can grow a business without having great team members. And one of the things that you've said along the line when we were talking about the, the experts and the, the middle of the doers and the followers is you need followers. Like not everybody has to be an expert in your business. And I say that meaning that you can be great at a task, but it doesn't mean you have to be an expert. And those followers are the ones that, pick up all the slack and they do it for a reasonable price. Oh, before we finish up, let me just ask you to address the, the question that always gets asked when we talk about outsourcing is, is it ethical to be paying someone like five US dollars an hour? Yeah. I mean, hiring from the Philippines, for example, the minimum wage is $12 a day, right? So it's not that tough to beat that. And also they have a much better opportunity. Like we pay VAs $5 an hour or more, go $5 an hour or up. And we also set things in place where when we sold free up, we had we had VAs making 20 bucks an hour out of the Philippines. And when we sold free up, we took $500,000 from the Philip or $5,000, $500,000 from the sale and gave it to our team in the Philippines. So just because you're hiring someone at a low rate, doesn't mean you shouldn't increase it over time. Doesn't mean that you shouldn't treat people well, especially if they help you achieve success, but you're also creating win-wins where they're getting a better opportunity than they would in their home country. They also don't have to drive to work. They can spend more time with their family. They can work from home, especially with COVID right now. How many people in the Philippines wish that they had a work from home job instead of having to, to go into work every day um, or being laid off right now. So you're opening up a lot of opportunity there. Don't think that you need to lowball people and pay people as cheap as possible. That's not what I'm preaching at all. No. And you can continue to hire people in the US, in Australia for those doer and expert roles and making sure that they have assistance and that they're not spending their time on repetitive tasks so that everyone wins and grows their businesses. And I've seen plenty of clients with free up that wouldn't have got off the ground if they had to hire full-time employees in the US. They hired some VAs, got them off the ground, hired US people. So those US people got jobs that they wouldn't have if that person didn't start with VAs and then gave their US people VAs. And you can, if you're against it, you can always hire US. You can make that hybrid. You can just go VAs like, like I do. There's no right or wrong here. There's pros and cons, but there's different ways to, to I'm all about creating that win-win-win for everyone. And if you're, if you are honestly creating that win-win-win for everyone, it's tough to th say that you're not being ethical. Uh, I agree with you because I, we, we live in a global community. So why can't we support everybody? Why does it only have to people be the people in our backyard? If we can make right. somebody else's life better, then who are we to say no? I completely agree. All right. So for people who are listening in and thinking, I really need to either upgrade my systems around hiring remotely or just make my life easier. Or you know what? I actually have to start hiring remotely. Maybe I can give away some of those, we could call them grunt work tasks, or maybe I need some higher level people to come in and help me grow because I know that this is holding me back. I know me doing so many things is holding the business back. Where can they learn more about Outsource School? 
Yeah, well, first of all, I'm one of the easiest entrepreneurs to contact online. Feel free to connect with me, Nathan Hirsch on Facebook or LinkedIn, Real Nate Hirsch on Instagram or Twitter. I love networking with other entrepreneurs. And if you have any questions, reach out. Uh, check out Outsource School. I mentioned if you buy our Cracking the VA code, you get a year access to Outsource School and all other courses included. We also have a lot of free tools for you. We have a productivity course that takes an hour to take and will make you faster going forward. We teach you a lot of cool tools there. We have a VA budget calculator that'll help you figure out how many VAs you can actually afford right now. We have a hot keys cheat sheet that you can give to your VA to study, pay them for an hour to study it, and they're going to be 15 to 20% faster going forward. And we have a case study where we break down the exact hires we made year one through four free up. So you can see who we hired and what year and how we structured it. So all those are available for free. Uh, definitely check out Outsource School. And I really appreciate you having me on. Thanks so much. I, I'm a firm believer, as I said, all of our team is remote. So I'm a firm believer of having VAs. We have a lot more expert and doer type people, but we do have the followers as well. And we, we also bring them on when we need them. So I know that I couldn't have grown my business to where it is with any of my businesses actually without those people. And I've made a lot of those mistakes. So the fact that you're going to shortcut all the past, all of those mistakes for a lot of people, that to me is just gold. So thank you very much. Yeah. Thanks so much for having me. I hope you enjoyed this week's episode of the Bringing Business to Retail podcast. You can find all of the show notes over at selenanight.com. If you found something that you heard today particularly useful, I'd love it if you could leave me a review on iTunes or Stitcher. And of course, feel free to share this episode with someone that you think could benefit by listening to it. Want more retail biz strategies? You can watch the Bringing Business to Retail TV show where each week I'll answer a question or provide you with a simple, actionable retail biz strategy that you can implement in your business right away. If you have a question or a guest, I'd love to hear from you. Drop my team an email at podcast at and I'll see you on the next episode. Have a great week.